panelists today are Dr. Platt, uh, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Jenkins. Uh, and we want to start by just giving them an opportunity to introduce themselves and, uh, you know, to talk about their role here at the university. Uh, ladies first, Dr. Jenkins. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you all for um, extending the invitation for me uh, to join uh, my wonderful colleagues um, who are all doing exceptional work. So I'm really honored to be a part of this, uh, this panel. And uh, I guess just briefly, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Educational Leadership in the College of Education uh, at U of SC. And um, I'm also director of the Museum of Education. Um, our college uh, is unique in that it has a, uh, a dedicated uh, museum um, for remembering, uh, highlighting, um, and advancing the understanding of like historical and contemporary issues within the field of education. Um, so it's the museum is another space in which uh, we can um, share and present research and information that's relevant to the field of education. Um, so that's a, 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 a wonderful um, addition to, to my work here at, at, um, at University of South Carolina. I'm also um, co-chair of the President's Diversity and Inclusion Advisory um, Committee, um, uh, along with um, uh, my colleague, Mike Kelly. Um, and, um, and that is a group of colleagues from across the country, um, the country, I'm sorry, across the um, campus um, that's really representative of uh, many of the stakeholders across campus that are uh, committed to issues of diversity and inclusion and, and that are, must be at the table when the university is, um, is considering issues of diversity and inclusion. So that's another um, role here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Platt. Hello, and thank you again for, uh, for inviting me also to take part in this conversation. So again, my name is Spencer Platt. I am an associate professor in the same department as uh, Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Anderson, uh, Educational Leadership and Policies. And uh, I also uh, have a couple other roles. I, uh, I direct the Community College Leadership Alliance, which is a certificate program designed to uh, sort of uh, assist and propel the next generation of leaders in the community college system across the state of South Carolina. And also, uh, I've been recently appointed the interim director for the Center for Innovation in Higher Education, also at the University of South Carolina. And uh, it's, a, it's a relatively new center. But again, uh, one, one of the goals of this center is to establish uh, itself as a leader in critical anti-racist research and thought. and. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, the work that we're doing in the center and the work that we'll, we'll uh, and many of the projects that we have going on. Thank you, Dr. Platt. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, Dr. Anderson, I know you had something Hello. you wanted to share. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I've got a few slides that I can share a little bit later as we, as we talk about some of these issues that I think uh, help inform um, the discussion, but for now I'll just introduce myself. My name is Christian Anderson. I'm Associate Professor of Higher Education along with Toby and, and Spencer and uh, here at USC. I've been here since 2007. I am primarily a, his, a historian of higher education. I also do work on organization and culture of, of higher education and policy, but with all of that there's always a historical aspect to it. Um, Relevant to today's discussion, uh, along with several other things that I've, I've done, is that I was co-chair of the committee that brought the Richard T. Green, Richard T. Greener statue to campus in 2018. And that was a uh, seven plus year process that started in the fall of 2010 when a student asked a simple question, uh, why don't we know anything about this guy here at USC and why is there nothing uh, that really helps us remember him. Of course, there, those in the Black Alumni Council know that there's a scholarship for him and there was there is a portrait of him, but those had a, a limited audience, but there was nothing uh, for, for a larger uh, audience. And uh, so that instigated a, a process that I can talk more about later that, that ended, I, well, I don't like saying it ended, it culminated with, the, with putting up that statue and, and we uh, hope to continue to engage 
uh, Professor Greener is an ongoing uh, educational uh, partner here at, at USC. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, yeah, I, I'm actually a member of the Black Alumni Council, and, uh, and I would agree that the Greener Scholarship is actually really important. And, and I think the statue actually brought uh, a lot to light about him and his role here at the university as well. So thank you. Uh, we, we've had a, a number of questions already that uh, we've reached out and, and we want to ask the panel. Uh, so yeah, uh, the panelists can feel free to answer these. Uh, I don't think they're difficult. So uh, <laughs> uh, if, if you had a response on just please let me know and uh, we, we definitely love to uh, hear a response from you guys on them. Uh, for the folks that are watching the panel online, uh, please feel free to submit those questions. And uh, after we go through a few of these questions, we'll have a chance to, to take some questions from the audience as well. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, I guess if, if you can each please just, you know, give us an opportunity to, just to hear some information about your research, your outreach efforts, uh, projects that you haven't already mentioned here at the university that promote, you know, our, our campuses, uh, 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 you know, efforts to increase diversity. Okay, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so, let me just say that in my research, when I do talk about the University of South Carolina, I, ne I never name it. Uh, so there may, be, there may or may not be instances where I, I write about the University of South Carolina. Uh, but let's see. Uh, but I, I do talk about uh, Black issues uh, in education in, in America in, in a lot of different ways. And so one of the... Uh, one of the, well, I'll just highlight several of the things that I have going on in terms of research projects. Uh, just last week, uh, and we haven't announced this acceptance yet, but we, uh, we got, a, uh, we did a proposal to uh, have a special issue of uh, the teacher's college record. Uh, and a special issue is, is sort of a, uh, an opportunity where uh, myself and a number of scholars, well, there are two other scholars who are editing that's a collection of articles by scholars across the country. And the, the, the title of this uh, special issue is, I Too Am America, Historical and Contemporary Progress and Pitfalls Towards Educational Equity in the Black American South. And so in this, we have a number of really cool articles. Uh, Dr. Anderson has, has, has an article in, in there uh, and his, is with John Hale and uh, Rose Jolamaki, and theirs is entitled uh, Catch the Learning, Penn Center and the Development of Education Since the Civil War. Uh, the first one is, is one that, I, that I'll lead off. Uh, it's Free and Equal in the Eyes of the Law, a Critical Review of P-20 Educational Practices, Law and Landmark Cases. And then we also have a number of, uh, we have two chapters on HBCUs or, and uh, another that's I think really cool, it's, not that I don't think all of them are cool, uh, but we also highlight uh, school district secession in the U.S. South through a critical race and uh, policy analysis. And this really talks about how uh, school districts uh, in resisting desegregation seceded from the existing school, uh, uh, school districts and created their own. Uh, I have a, a couple, I guess three books uh, that are out now, uh, one in 2019, which is uh, Comprehensive Multicultural and Education in the 21st Century. It's uh, Increasing Access in the Age of Retrenchment. Another on Multicultural Education in the 21st in Century, Innovative Research and Practices in Higher Education. Then uh, also, uh, I guess just a few months ago, uh, Dr. Henry Tran and I were awarded an NSF grant, uh, and this one is titled Investigating the Barriers to Retention and Tenure for Black and Hispanic Engineering Faculty at Research One Universities. Uh, I also uh, serve on, as, as the uh, incoming secretary for the, for the Faculty Senate, and I was awarded uh, as one of three of the University of South Carolina's 2020 Social Justice Awards. So th those are some of the some of the cool things that that, that are that are going on uh, that, that I have going on and have had going on in the in the, in the very recent past. Uh, 
Dr. Platt, I, I know you're an alumni uh, back from 1998. I mean, how do you think things have changed here at the university? And, and do you feel like there's been an increase in diversity since then? Not to say that you're, not to say that that was too long ago. <laughs> no, you, you know, uh, I, I, things have definitely changed. But, and, and you know, at the same time, when I was a student here at the University of South Carolina, Toby was also a student. And so, uh, or Dr. Jenkins, rather. <laughs> And, and so, <laughs> so, so it, it's, it, things have changed, but in terms of uh, racial ethnic diversity, I, I, I wouldn't say it's increased. In fact, it's, it's decreased by, by a large margin. Uh, I, and uh, Dr. Jenkins, you can correct me if, 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 if you know the statistics. I, I think in 1996, uh, U.S. The University of South Carolina had, I, I want to say, twenty-five-ish percent black students, wow. uh, and that, that was that was that was a peak, and uh, it's it's been uh, it, it's come down precipit precipitously since then, and I, I think it's inching back up here recently. But I think currently it's right around the nine ten percent. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I don't I don't know the exact numbers. I need to because we bring this up often, and so I need to, I really just need to have that that statistic. But it's it's de decreased by half, mm -hmm. wow. which is significant enough. It doesn't even matter what the number originally was. If it's decreased by half over the last uh, twenty or so years, um, that's a problem. Well, Dr. Jenkins, uh, I mean, well, I guess I can I can you know go to you for the same question. You know, outside of the things that you've already mentioned. You know, what projects do you have going on or, you know, what research are you working on that, you know, is looking to increase the diversity here at, uh, here at Carolina? Yeah, so um, kind of reiterating what uh, Dr. Platt was saying about our work, because what's interesting is this, this panel that you all have um, convened is a panel of higher education researchers. <laughs> so we research higher education broadly. Um, and so it's not necessarily just, uh, you know, specifically focused on our campus always, um, but our campus or our institution uh, most definitely um, is included or can benefit or, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's, um, it's relevant to the work on our campus, but we don't necessarily, um, you know, just target or specifically look at um, the University of South Carolina. So when we talk about kind of the broad research and work um, I'm doing, so, so first, before uh, kind of coming into the professorate as a researcher, um, I spent about a decade working in diversity and inclusion and student affairs, um, and particularly running university cultural centers. So a lot of my initial work um, it, as a professor or researcher um, is around university cultural centers and particularly like multicultural student affairs um, and that work on college campuses. Um, so kind of looking at uh, the impact of those departments, the importance of those departments, um, the challenges that they face, um, and really uh, uh, their role as being like one of the most outward facing um, uh, resources for an institution, um, but often the most disenfranchised department on campus and uh, the complexities, you know, with that. So um, I've spent uh, many years not only uh, kind of writing about um, university cultural centers, but also um, serving as a, um, uh, a, a lead national expert um, do, conducting program reviews for uh, cultural centers and multicultural student affairs departments across the country, right? So, um, you know, uh, typically in student affairs, every five years, their departments are supposed to have um, an external committee kind of come in and evaluate their department and the work of their department. And they, um, they bring in a national expert to, um, to kind of lead that process. And I've led that process for several institutions across the country. Um, and um, most more recently, uh, you know, something that I'm working on that's uh, about to come out is a, a kind of reflective piece on the last 10 years of leading these um, program reviews of university cultural, um, cultural centers and, and um, multicultural student affairs departments, kind of what I'm seeing across the board and commonalities, struggles, problems, um, and issues that they are facing across the country. 
um, you know, because, um, you know, one of the things that as, as I was looking at um, the, 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 the topic of this panel and kind of one of the things, you know, what do I want to say about um, race and the college experience? Well, one of the things I want to say is that like for any institution, um, whether it's USC or um, U of SC or any other institution across the country, it, um, that we don't necessarily, I don't, I know uh, from someone in the field doing this work, I want to hear about an institution's commitments to diversity and, and commitments to anti-racism if their cultural center or multicultural student affairs department is still in the basement somewhere, underfunded, understaffed, um, and not being propelled to do the incredible work that they were created um, to do. Because again, that's one of your most outward facing resources. Um, and, um, and in my opinion, budgets are moral documents. Budgets are moral documents. And so if you want to see where an institution's priorities really are, um, look at how their departments are, um, are funded um, and what departments are underfunded. That's telling you how, um, how committed an institution is to it. Um, so that's one piece. Um, another piece of my work, I'm working on a book right now called Hip Hop Mindfulness. Um, and so I've done um, so, uh, 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 another piece of work in looking at spaces completely outside of educational institutions that are spaces that cultivate brilliance, um, inclusion, engagement, achievement, among um, um, ethnically diverse um, youth and young adults um, and what uh, educational institutions can learn from those spaces. So not how can we use hip hop to teach, but what can we learn from the environment of hip hop culture um, and the spaces of hip hop culture um, that we probably need to um, recreate or, um, or embrace um, for ourselves uh, in the way that we practice, we uh, approach practice in education. And then finally, I'm also working on another book um, on uh, innovating graduate education. Um, and, um, and so that's particularly looking at, like, um, with a background, backdrop of issues of race and social justice, et cetera, but looking at innovation. Um, and it, it's talking about how and what we teach graduate students. Um, and it's driven by two things. So you know, one is in general, I, I have a belief that we need to reconceive or conceptualize what scholarship is. Um, so if we're talking about that we want to, that we want higher education institutions to be spaces that really influence the public sector, um, but we situate research and scholarship and we teach graduate students um, to engage research and scholarship in a way that, 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 um, relegates it only into academic journals where we're talking to each other, but the average person is learning in social media and in the public sphere. Um, and we're not in that space. We're not even, in, you know, engaged in that space. Then, then we're doing the public a disservice because we aren't providing um, informed, like information, really informed conversation or discussion in those spaces um, to help people to, to learn about these issues. So in this particular book, um, it, you know, one of the other things that I, I'm looking at is like how the, this, this space of graduate education disenfranchises people, right? So you, you think of education as being a, a, the, 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 um, the idea of education is about mobility and opportunity and possibility. Um, but the reality is, and in my opinion, the, the, the more educated um, uh, the education like um, increases our minds and, and shrinks our guts. That the more educated you become, the more clear it becomes um, what you are not capable of doing or what you shouldn't do, uh, right? So you, you start out wanting to take on the world and the more educated you become, you get a master's degree and they're like, oh no, you gotta wait, you need to, to, to you know, get a doctorate, get a doctorate and it's like, okay, well, just, just finish you just focus on getting the dissertation done. Don't try to do, you know, too much or be um, too much in it. Just wait, you know, and if you, let's say you go into the professorate, you get an assistant professor job, you got to get tenure, hold off, you know, don't, don't, don't um, ruffle too many feathers. You, uh, you finally get tenure and you're like, okay, I can finally do what I want to do. And it's like, well, mm, you still got to get full. You still have one. There's always a reason why someone should not instead of, um, this idea of possibility. And, and meanwhile, everyone outside of the educational environment 
all of your friends and family, they think you're brilliant and that you could do anything. Look at all that you've achieved, right? But inside the space that's supposed to build up your capacity is shrinking you down to believe that you can't do much of anything. Um, and so I, I think the way that we teach graduate students needs to change. Um, and so that, that's one of the, 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 the focuses of, um, of this new book on graduate education and teaching practice in graduate education. Um, and then finally, the, the last thing I'm working on, like I said, I'm, I'm director of the Museum of Education. Um, so I have an outreach um, a program that's focused on African-American girls, um, and it's, it's named in honor of Satima Clark, who was a, a civil rights giant, um, and um, that most many people don't even know her name um, or are aware of her. Um, that Martin Luther King called her the grandmother of the civil rights movement, but you know she's not taught at all about you know when it, when it comes to the civil rights movement. Um, so, in the honor of Black women's voices who have been um, kind of silenced and ignored um, in history. Uh, this program is, um, is focused on advancing the voice of Black girls and experiences of Black girls, but particularly, um, and, and the way I'm wanting to grow this, I'm working on a grant right now to grow it, um, but for, for Black um, young adult women um, and girls to really consider museum careers um, as activist spaces, because there are very few spaces in society that uh, allows truth-telling. Right, you you can't come into a classroom and 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 try to be a truth teller. They're going to shut you down, right? And even in spaces you think like uh, it's not allowed in church, it's not allowed in school, it's not allowed here, it's not allowed there, right? So then they take it to the streets. That's why they're in the streets. But even there, you're confronted with police, right? And and, and you're, you're, you're there's an attempt for silence. So there's not a lot of spaces that allow for, for um, young people in particular to counter historical lies, to tell contemporary truths, but museums are one of them. Museums are a space where people come in expecting to interact with difficult information, with hard truths. Um, and so the ways that we can expand museum studies and museum careers um, to, to be more inclusive for Black women and Black girls, um, to um, advance careers in that field and to see that as, um, as, as new activist spaces, it's powerful to have stewardship over physical space where you can invite communities in to hold their meetings and convene in the ways that churches used to do uh, in the civil rights movement. Like I see museums as, um, as in the futures of museums as being really important um, in, in this realm. So those are kind of my three areas. Sorry that I've gone on a little long. <laughs> no, 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 we, we really appreciate it. Actually, I, I, I wrote a couple quotes down <laughs> that I'm going to use later. <laughs> Budgets are Psychic more than documents. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if y'all heard that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, same question to you. Uh, let me, if I can repeat it. Uh, you know, share us any, you know, research or, you know, outreach efforts, projects you have at the university that are looking to promote our campus increased diversity. All right. Um, so I've been, uh, when I took the history of higher education class in, my master's program and then a, a couple of different ones in my uh, PhD program, I thought of issues surrounding race as events. We had the Morrill Act of 1890, which helped create HBCUs. University X desegregated in 1960, University Y desegregated in 1965, and kind of like neat little packages, boom, 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 these things happened, let's move on. Issues of race are not neat, do not come in neat little packages. They are threads that go throughout the history of higher education, um, you know, including colonial higher education all the way back, you know, to 1636 with the founding of, of Harvard. And so everyone uh, on this, uh, at this event probably recognizes this photo. This is from September 11th, 1963 on Ray Monteith. Robert Anderson and James Solomon desegregating the University of South Carolina for the second time. Um, and uh, we think of that as like a singular important event. But as uh, Dr. Platt and Dr. Jenkins pointed out before, uh, you know, we've had some increases in diversity over time, but then decreases. Uh, you know, they, they alluded to the fact that we were in the, you know, 25% 
area in the 1990s, and now we're at around 10% um, African American students at, at University of South Carolina. Um, since we're this is an alumni event, let me tell, let me use a, a story to to talk about you know some of the research that I, that I've worked on. Um, so in we're going to go from 1963 back to 1936. The Alumni Association at the University of South Carolina decided to honor its oldest living alumnus. And so they sent a letter to Alonzo Gray Townsend, class of 1876, and said, we want to honor you as our oldest uh, living alumnus at homecoming. And we're going to give you a ceremonial cane. And, you know, it's going to be a big deal. Well. A few weeks later, they essentially sent uh, you know, a letter saying, uh, never mind, no thanks, don't worry about it. What they didn't realize was that Mr. Townsend was black. And they couldn't, of course, honor the oldest living alumnus in 1936 in Jim Crow, South Carolina, to a black man. And this is part of the university's history that for a long time was not very well understood, the fact that we had a desegregated university from 1873 until 1877. And uh, the majority, more than 50%, and at times more than 75% of the students were black. And uh, many of these alums went on to do incredible things as politicians, bankers, uh, Supreme Court justices, uh, um, farmers, uh, intellectuals, university presidents, the list goes on. If I had all day, I, you know, I, I could uh, give you all kinds of uh, fascinating stories. And of course, uh, and, we, and there was a, a normal school for, for, uh, for teachers, most of them black women. One of those graduates was Celia Dial Saxon, who was one of Columbia's most uh, distinguished and important uh, educators. Uh, a school was named for her, and that school stood where the Strom Thurmond uh, Wellness Center stands now. Uh, I'll, I'll save commentary on that for later. And of course, we also had a black professor, Richard T. Greener, who was the first black graduate of, uh, of Harvard. Uh, a student in our program, Jason Darby, and I have been working on this project, looking at all of these, as many of these alumni as we can, and you know each story is more fascinating than than the next, uh, and and it's incredible uh, what some of these alumni did, and that um, the this history was essentially erased. This is a piece uh, from the ledger of um, one of the literary societies on campus, and they literally ripped out the pages of of when the students were here during the Reconstruction era, and as you can see, wrote Negro regime as if that was an illegitimate part of our past. And now let's you know, wipe that out and, and, and move on. Um, and so uh, in terms of this idea of, of untold stories, another one that I worked on with another uh, student of mine, Alfred Moore, was uh, the fact that we had a chance to desegregate in 1946. John Wrighton, uh, a, a graduate of SC State, applied to the law school in 1946, and the law school denied his admission because he was black. And so he sued with the help of Thurgood Marshall, no less, as, his, as one of the attorneys. And this lawsuit, Wrighton versus the University of South Carolina, uh, was for him to be admitted and Judge Waits, Waitie's Waring gave the university and the state three choices. You can admit him, you can close the law school, or you can open a separate, I'm going to put it in scare quotes, separate but equal law school. And we all know that the university did not admit him in 1946. The state opened a separate law school uh, at at SC State that was open only 19 years and only graduated 55 students. But some of those students went on to be to become some of the most distinguished lawyers in the history of South Carolina, including Ernest Finney, who went on to become the lawyer that defended the, the Friendship Nine in Rock Hill and the first black 
Supreme Court Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of South Carolina, and none other than Matthew Perry, who sued to desegregate Clemson and the University of South Carolina in 1963. So creating a segregated law school didn't exactly have the long-term effect that they hoped for. Um, and then a few years later, there was a, a dean in our own College of Education, Chester Travelstead, who gave a talk just uh, after the board, uh, Brown v. Board of Education decision was made, basically saying that we should, now that this is the law of the land, we should desegregate our, our schools and we should prepare to desegregate our university. Um, so there was another chance for the university to desegregate a second time. And instead of doing that, they fired him. Um, and so then, you know, fast forward to 1963, you know, when we finally did desegregate. Um, so, you know, we've got a complicated past here at the University of South Carolina. We still have uh, former slave quarters that stand behind the president's house. And two uh, uh, plaques went up in, 19, in 2017 to, to acknowledge that. Um, you know, we have signage that, you know, may be problematic in certain ways. And the Richard T. Greener statue, which I'll talk about in a second, the commemoration garden of the, of the 1963 desegregation. And then in terms of some of the research that I do, one of the things that I have going on is Right now, uh, I shouldn't be here. I should be leading a, um, an NEH summer institute for teachers from around the country to learn about the black lawmakers that, uh, that, uh, that uh, were in office in South Carolina during Reconstruction. However, it got coroned like so many other things, so it's postponed until next summer. Um, but the election of those black lawmakers is what led to four black trustees being appointed at the University of South Carolina, which led to the first black student, Henry Hain, being uh, uh, admitted in 1873 and Richard T. Greener coming in 1873. And of course, when Reconstruction ended in 1877, all of that went away and the university reopened as a uh, institution for whites only uh, again in 1880. So the Greener statue stands not just as a symbol of, of Greener's accomplishments, which were many. Uh, he served as librarian, he attended the law school, he taught Latin and Greek, he started a preparatory school for uh, black students who were not well prepared for college education, but also it stands as a, as a symbol of how we can reclaim our past reclaim our history and, and, and learn more, uh, you know, ab about these parts of our history that, you know, frankly, most people don't, uh, don't know about. So um, I'll, I'll end there. And, and once again, thanks for involving me in, in, this, uh, in this event. No, 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 uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, we, we appreciate you guys just taking the time. Uh, as you mentioned, you guys probably couldn't go anywhere anyway. So, you know, we're glad you took the time to, you know, speak with us today during this panel. Uh, like, like you mentioned, Dr. Anderson, I mean, obviously our, our, our campus or our school has had a, a really complicated past, problematic past. Uh, do you feel like today, uh, you know, just currently, what advantages or initiatives does our university have, you know, that encourages or assists, you know, these conversations regarding race, you know, here at the school, as well as just in the city and in the state? Well, I think that one of the advantages that we have at the University of South Carolina is that we are, uh, Toby has the Museum of Education, which uh, is a critically important uh, resource on campus, but the whole campus is really a, a living museum. Uh, we, uh, the horseshoe, uh, the, the parts of campus that used to belong to Ward 1, which was a black neighborhood that was essentially taken over in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and uh, replaced with university facilities, including the um, the Coliseum, the former you know, home of the of the basketball team, the Coger Center, the Colonial Life Arena, the Strom Thurmond. All of that was a was a black neighborhood, and it was you know. And again, I'm going to use my scare quotes. It was blighted because they said, "Oh, this is a under un, you know a, a, this, this isn't a good neighborhood." Well, it was a good neighborhood. 
there were churches, there were schools, there were uh, 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 hotels and, and lodging, uh, you know, many of them, you know, some of them which were, were in the Green Book. I, I think our Booker T. Washington building was also a high school there. My aunts and right. I went and, uh, to that to that high school. Right, and the only thing that remains is the is the is the auditorium. Um, and so you know, it was not a, a bad neighborhood. It was not a rich, you know, luxurious neighborhood. But it was not a blighted neighborhood. It was not a poor neighborhood. Um, but the city and the university essentially colluded to to move into that area, and. Um, you know, Bobby Donaldson has done great work with interviews from, from people from those areas, and he's recovered all kinds of photographs to help us reclaim that history and start to understand what it was, was like. And, you know, the story I hear over and over again is of people who lived right there and would walk past the university and walk around the university to get to Booker T. Washington because they were not welcome on the university grounds. Mm. So I think one of the advantages we have here is that we have this, you know, environment that we can engage with and, and it's not some, you know, far away place that we're, we're looking at and, and reading about, but we can physically walk through it and talk about it and, and conceptualize what these structures of racism uh, were like. Dr. Platt, uh, same question to you. Uh, you know, what initiatives, <clears throat> what initiatives do you think we have at the university that help with these conversations regarding race? And if not, I mean, where do you see, you know, any growth areas that we need to work on? Yeah, so uh, let's see. Some of the advantages that we have, uh, I think, I think uh, Dr. Anderson really made a, an, an excellent point when he talked about the, uh, the campus itself being a museum. And what, one of the thoughts that I have is, you know, I, I think in South Carolina, we, we tend to think that our, our greatest assets uh, in terms of a state are the land and the tourism. But I, 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 would, I, would, I would say that the, uh, the greatest assets that we have are the human capital, you know, the people of South Carolina. Uh, now, I think it's underdeveloped, it's under uh, invested in, you know, I, I think, uh, I think uh, we are where we are in terms of uh, the educational ranking of the state because of this lack of investment. But if we had a different mindset and a different will, uh, we could really unlock uh, a tremendous potential. Because um, when I think about it, you know, we essentially uh, look at large segments of the population and just sort of, in many ways, cast them aside as if they aren't useful. But if we, again, invested in this potential and actually uh, use schooling as a way to equip and set up folks for uh, innovative, technological, economic, entrepreneurial success, then uh, even though it's a small state, I think it could be a, a giant among states. Uh, and, you know, in terms of thinking about the disadvantages, again, uh, I think it's this, uh, we, we here at South Carolina, like the rest of the South and the rest of uh, America have a, a racism and a bias problem. Uh, but the upside is because places like South Carolina have, have always had large black populations uh, and the, 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 you know, Largely, folks have lived peaceably among one another, you know. Uh, I think South Carolina's positioned powerfully to overcome this legacy, again, but it, it requires the will to do so, you know. Uh, you know, I think, I think the other disadvantage we might have would be the, again, this lack of investment in people and the potential and this lack of investment in education, including higher education, right? Well, I mean, uh, and, and finally, the lack of belief in human potential. But what were you going to ask for? Sorry. Well, no, I mean, I, I know you've done some research on, you know, really helping minorities reach that highest level of de highest level degree in their professions. I mean, can, can you speak on that for a moment? Yeah. Uh, again, yeah, I, I, you know, some of my my dissertation and some of my earliest work was really focused on uh, on doctoral education and uh, specifically black males in, doc in, in doctoral programs. Uh, you know, I was looking at uh, a number of things, but again, 
the, the, the purpose I felt for, of this research was to illuminate pathways and sort of to uh, help folks understand uh, what people were dealing with in doctoral programs and find ways to navigate uh, the, the systems that, that are our doctoral programs. Um, so, so, you know, I, I look at the, uh, the, the, the relationship that doctoral students have with their advisors. I look at uh, some of the, the pathways that folks take and how, how folks have been able in a number of different ways to overcome some of the obstacles that they've faced. Uh, I look at socialization. And in this current NSF uh, grant, one of, a large component is looking at uh, sort of the, uh, the, the, the culture and climate, the socialization processes that go on in engineering uh, departments. And again, this is with, this is with university faculty. And, and, uh, and again, it's, it's to, uh, to help folks see what's out there uh, and figure out ways that they, they can uh, navigate, but also to, to point out to institutions some of the issues and problems that they have and ways in which they can think about doing things differently and better to, to be more inclusive. If I can add just a, a word to that, uh, to what Dr. Platt was saying is, I definitely think one of our greatest assets is our students in terms of their enthusiasm and, and uh, curiosity in, in uncovering both contemporary issues, the kinds of things that Dr. Platt and Dr. Jenkins work on, and historical issues, the kind of things that I work on. I mentioned uh, students in our program, Jason Darby and Alfred Moore, in conjunction with the couple of the projects that I mentioned. Uh, another uh, recent master student, Caleb Morris, um, worked on a project about the history of the Afro-American Association when it was founded in the late 1960s, and he and I were able to present that at a historical conference. And, uh, you know, I, I'm constantly uh, um, so impressed with the enthusiasm that, that students have about uncovering these stories and telling these stories. And um, uh, so I, I think that's one, one, a great strength that we have here as well. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you again, guys. Um, his, historically, I feel like, uh, well, Historically, education has kind of been used as a tool to, you know, uh, oppress, you know, it's, it's just far back as, you know, slavery, where slaves weren't allowed to, to learn to read or write. Um, Dr. Jenkins, can you, can you, uh, can you speak on like the exam, I, I know you've done some research in this area, can you speak on, on the ex examination of education as a, as a, as a, as a tool in a, in a space for oppression as well as liberation? Uh, I know you said earlier that, you know, you can't do any real truth telling in the, in the classroom. So if you can. Yeah, well, I'm, I think you can. I think you can do truth telling in a college classroom. I think I, I was probably more so thinking about the, the kind of the strains that maybe public P through 12 teachers face in what they can and can't teach and, and, and particularly what students can and can't bring into that space. Um, I would hope you know, you think that a, a, a good college classroom is open um, to for students bringing in, like we would welcome students being so into the subject matter that they would actually bring in so, uh, topics and, and information to discuss. So um, I, I would hope that a college classroom would be a little different. But yeah, I mean, you, you know, I think it's, it's not a um, revelation that education is used um, to, uh, to kind of drive society. Um, and so um, what information you want people to know, um, the best way to do, to, 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 um, to advance that is through education. And so um, in, in many ways, it's a political driver um, by, by the fact of what's taught and what's not taught. Um, but then also who's allowed to be educated and who, who um, isn't, um, who has access to it and who doesn't. Um, so, you know, it, it's all of those different um, spaces and, and, and ways. Um, right now I'm, I'm reworking an exhibit that we have in the, um, the museum on uh, that explores violence in education. And so all of the different ways that violence manifests or has manifested itself in education from school discipline 
through spirit murder of students, through curriculum violence that excludes um, various cultures, um, through um, push out and um, zero tolerance policies, um, to you know ex more explicit things like um, hate crimes and um, bullying and, and and things of that nature. Um, but in the the fall, I'm, I'm adding um, some you know more. Uh, ex exhibits on specifically on racial violence in um, in, in education, and um, and the reality is uh, whether it's higher education or uh, you know P through twenty um, education as a sector as a field has participated in racial violence from the very beginning, right? So we know um, Wilder's work, um, Ebony and Ivy, that came out year, um, several years ago. Kind of looking at the uh, the history of slavery, particularly among elite institutions, um, that then drove lots of other um, more public four-year institutions like our own, um, but like also UVA and, and other places, um, to kind of examine their own histories and how uh, enslaved people were used to build their campuses and um, and were uh, maids, etc., um, on on the campus. Um, but there, it flows through you know, almost era, every era, um, so, right? So the, the Morrill Act was created during the Nader period. That's like the worst, most violent period in, in um, African-American history, um, you know, was when this was, um, this was happening. And so um, the ways that um, higher education institutions, you know, chose to deal with uh, you know, having wanting, people wanting to be educated and, um, and maybe more money flowing to uh, HBCUs or being more HBCUs being built so that white institutions um, don't have to admit um, through the um, activism of the 60s where, um, you know, black student, college student activists were uh, calling their institutions to task about uh, what was being taught there um, and, 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 um, and, um, and how included they were in the, the, the life of the campus, right? And so, um, the, you know, the reality is that it was, it's through protest that our campuses have become even the rich, uh, the culturally rich spaces that they are, you know, and even if they're not all the way where we think they need to be, they wouldn't even be here if it weren't for um, the college student protesters and, and activists sitting in and creating ethnic studies um, and cultural studies and cultural centers and multicultural student affairs departments and all of these things that were direct results from, um, from, from student activism. Um, and so, and then you, again, then you flow now into this space where I think one of the, the, the major things that's happening that allows even an institution like ours um, to, to have this decrease that we're seeing in, um, in the number of students is um, uh, this kind of satiation or soft language um, that, that, that comes with, with how we even deal with race in the college experience or race in higher education, right? So, you know, I think one of the most important things that we can do is to revise our language around it, right? So this soft language um, that has us um, like, talk about even things like potential areas of growth, right? Even that's soft. That's a, that's a, a soft way to, to view things rather than have a freight discussions on how are education institutions failing students? How are they contributing to, um, to you know, contemporary forms of, of, of racial violence, right? So even when we are dealing, even when we're researching and studying these issues with the effort or the goal to make a change, we're talking about, we're using language like marginalized versus racially targeted or chilly climates versus racially hostile climates, unsupportive environments versus anti-black, naming it exactly what it is, harmful policies versus racially violent policies, you know? Um, and so it, it's, it, it, if, if you don't have a, a, a a real response to the cultures of blackface parties on, on college campuses and how racially violent that is and how unsafe that might be. I remember I was at another institution when I was in student affairs working and 
um, protest came from a, a, the black student union president being called nigger when he walked across campus, right? And that's another thing I don't do. I'm not going to call it the N-word because that demeans the horror of that word, right? We need to hear it. Um, and so, uh, but in the, 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 the institutional or, or the executive leader meetings, you know, um, leaders were saying that, you know, they didn't want to put themselves in a hostile situation with students and where the students are going to attack them. Um, and, you know, my response is, imagine how he felt. He's in an environment that's wrestling with how, how to, to, you know, like, he's fearing for his life because that's what that type of fear that comes when for a, a, a young Black boy who is hundreds of miles away from home, from his family, you know, here on campus by himself, and he's being called this, like, he's fearing for his life, and you're just scared to go talk to the students, you know what I'm saying, like, it, it's, it, it, it's unacceptable, um, and so in, in some ways, we really have to, um, to just directly face it and deal with it as ugly, um, you know, as ugly as it is, or Otherwise, we're, we're just continuing to maintain it. it the, the education continues to be a space um, where Black students, ethnically diverse students um, of all races are just managing, getting through oppression, through an oppressive environment, as opposed to being in a space um, where they can thrive. Oh, your your mic, your mic is um, your mic is is muted. No, well, well, actually, I was I was speechless for a second, just trying to you know, <laughs> just you know, just trying to take it in, you know. I was, but I will say, I was I was yeah, yeah. I, I will uh, say I, though that USC, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, we keep calling it USC, UFSC, um, is it is poised in a really important way. You know what I'm saying? Because when you're, y'all were having the, the other discussion, the, um, you know, before I started talking about um, advantages that we have as an institution, we have a lot. You know what I'm saying? We have a lot of truly committed and dedicated faculty, staff, and students, right, that are about this work and that are really um, wanting to do incredible things. We have a resource-rich institution, even amidst this pandemic. Like, I know everyone's crying broke with the pandemic, um, but we have resources and we can galvanize those resources, whether they're human, structural, financial, um, to, to address both global crises, right? So we know Boston just proclaimed racism to be a, a public health crisis as well. I agree. Um, and so, but, but we, we, we're poised to be able to address both the, the COVID crisis and um, the, you know, race, pervasive racism that's um, been in our society since, since um, uh, Europeans landed here. Um, and, um, but we also have like important precedents in place, like things like Christian's course, um, where, um, it results in real outcomes, not just exercises, right? That only the professor is going to read. Like the, the, the results of his course, his course results it in, um, in, in helping to, to, to balance out the, the built environment of our campus. That's, that's an important outcome. Um, we have that, the Center for Civil Rights um, with, with Dr. Donaldson. We have Cato. We have a Council of Diversity Officers where every college has a diversity officer in it. That's a gr great start of a structure. Um, but we have, you know, within the College of Education, our college is leading the way in, in having our diversity officer being a full-time paid, well funded, well funded, um, you know, position where it's the, the, there's an office, there's a staff, there's a budget, um, and there's a full-time person dedicated to doing this work within that particular college. Uh, we need more of that. Uh, we have an Office of Multicultural Student Affairs. We need to study and figure out what more can we do to build this. There's no reason why um, AMSA should be exactly where it was 20 something years ago, how long it was, Spencer, when we were here, you know? Um, uh, we, we have race and career reconciliation. Our, our college has the Center for um, the Equity and Education of African American Students. It's doing incredible work um, with P through 12 schools um, throughout our state and, and country. Um, and so, and we even have changing mindsets, like the fact that there was support for our athletes to get involved in activism this summer, I think is really important because typically that's a, you know, 
shut up and, and play, you know, type of uh, environment in college sports, uh, in any type of sports arena. So uh, the fact that our institution was supportive of that, um, you know, I think um, is, is uh, represents possibility. Um, but we got to continue. That doesn't mean that we're there. You know, we've got to continue to to do um, important work. So, you know, like looking at these admission policies, we were all happy to see the SET and ACT, which probably was just a, really less about race and more about the pandemic. But I'll take it regardless, because for <laughs> decades we've been studying the problems, the racial problems with this. Celebrate the um, little wins. You know? Yeah, we'll say we'll take it. We'll celebrate <laughs> the little wins. But let's also extend it to the GRE. As a, you know, um, as University of Maryland son, and well, I'm, I'm um, a lawyer, so let's get rid of the LSAT. LSAT, let's do that one too. GMAT, let's, let's keep on going. Um, you know, hiring boost. I think we, you know, when Spencer and I talk about the the, the cultural environment, uh, when when we were here in the '90s, um, you know, I remember there being so many African American students in front of the Russell House when we were students here that. If I were like late for something or really need to get somewhere, I would have to rethink, do I really want to, to walk that way? Do I want to walk in front of, because I would get caught up with all the, the, you know, all the students that hang out by the tree in front of the Russell House. And, like that's how many students, like the, the presence of African-American students was just so visible. Um, maybe we need to rethink this culture of the policies that have pushed our student events and everything off campus. So now it doesn't even have a feel, a cultural feel um, on 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 our campus, and yeah, I understand the 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 safety and in in issues that people just have with parties and and things of that nature or whatever. But the reality is, those cultural events contribute to the cultural climate and the cultural environment on our campus. We need to bring our students back on campus so that it can feel more like a a, a, um, a, a space where. Um, it students of uh, you know any ethnically diverse student will want to be and that they know that they belong there yeah I'm trying to think about uh, I, I know you guys were there in the late 90s I was there uh, 2003 to 2007 and we definitely had chicken finger Wednesdays out there DJ uh, Russell house parties uh, so now I'm just trying to think about you know what do we need to bring those things back? I, when I was in school, we did have some safety issues. Uh, I, can't, I can't say that any events with a bunch of college students won't have safety issues though. So I'm not exactly sure why we have removed those things and not others. So maybe that's something that should be revisited and, and somebody should you know, study. Uh, like the researchers we have here as our panelists. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I really want to thank everybody for joining here, Dr. Platt, Dr. Anderson, and Dr. Jenkins. Uh, we really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time again to, to, speak with, to speak with us and the 100 folks we have here on Zoom and the hundreds of folks we have actually on our Facebook uh, that we're uh, streaming to live as well. Uh, I know we wanted to have a chance to uh, uh, thank the College of Education representatives, as well as the Black Alumni Council, which I'm a member of as well, for uh, putting this, this discussion on. We've had a few folks in the comments here that are asking if uh, this is being recorded. This is being recorded. Uh, I know we are figuring out a way to have this available to everyone uh, once this ends, so we'll definitely get that information out as well. Uh, and it looks like some folks are asking for more panels with the same members. So uh, I guess that's a discussion that we'll <laughs> we'll have to have, and we'll see if, we'll see if you guys are interested in, in in coming back on and continuing this conversation. Especially for, uh, Dr. Anderson, I you know I learned more on the panel here today about uh, our problematic history and especially everything that was going on during Reconstruction. Uh, so, so it was definitely informative for me as well. Uh, so, and again, I, I want to thank you guys. If, if there's anything else you guys want to say uh, before we close out, uh, I'll give, give you guys an opportunity now. Just to say thanks for hosting this. This has been a fascinating interchange and exchange of, uh, of ideas. So I'm sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. There were some, some great ones, but I know we are limited on time, so uh, thanks again. I'd also like to say thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure, and uh, if you'd like to have a, have me back, I can't speak for the rest of folks, but I, I'd be happy to. Yep, uh, just ditto to everything they're saying. Thanks to everyone, um, and I would also encourage, um, even beyond this, 
you know, within our college, we will continue to push out um, all of our events and, and hopefully we need to share those out. Um, I will definitely now think to share their, the, uh, the things going on in the museum out with the um, Alumni Association uh, to, to ensure that that community is getting it. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's a, a lot being offered, um, particularly amongst our group here um, and within our broader college um, that I hope that everyone will continue to engage in uh, as we get into the fall. So thank you. Thank you guys again. I, I want to take a note to, uh, again, thank you. Uh, thank the University of South Carolina Alumni Association for helping us put this on. I, I want to note to everybody that's on the Zoom, um, we definitely have the uh, uh, Black Alumni Council uh, Richard Greener uh, Scholarship. <clears throat> Richard Greener Scholarship, if you have any, if, if you feel it in your heart today to uh, donate to the scholarship, uh, that definitely helps out minorities here at the University of South Carolina. We really appreciate it. Uh, and again, that recording, the recording of today's uh, panel will be available on our social media accounts, as well as on the, uh, the Facebook and web, or it'll be on the website as well. Thank you yeah. again, everybody. Cool. <laughs> Bye, thank you.